Hi everyone, a very good evening. Let me introduce myself before we start uh, talking about our today's topic. I'm Krishna and uh, have been associated with Edirica for close to two plus years and I'm in this teaching profession for close to 15 years and I was doing one on one sessions, corporate trainings and doing online sessions from last two and a half years uh, and uh, yeah, that's more about me. So let's start with the actual topic today. So agenda of the topic is what is probability for data science how uh, introduction to probability and we will understand how it applies to data science and we will also discuss about some part of statistics which is used for data science and this is a general fundamental session this is just a template so we do not have much hands on um, there are a lot of ppts here so how probability helps this is basically pure mathematics session so where we try to understand what each concept of mathematics is to a foundation level then we will see how it applies to data science so starting with probability so probability is a measure of how likely an event can occur like for example when you throw a dice or a throw a coin you would say that okay the probability of occurring a dice getting a number of one will be one by six whereas when the probability of occurring a head or tail when you toss a coin will be one by two which is a 0.5 so it's more of what is the chance of occurring an event that's what we call probability now there are certain terms we use in probability right from random experiments sample space and event so event is nothing but what are the outcomes you expect and out of an ex experiment and sample space is what are the possible outcomes like when you toss a head or tail possible outcomes are head tail and all right those are all comes in your sample space and random experiment is more about what is the experiment you conduct where you know the outcome cannot be predicted with certain certainty and you have different probabilities uh, there is a joint probability disjoint probability so joint probability is more about what is the probability of uh, getting a student 100 marks in a particular subject like statistics and 100 marks in the probability okay so it is like a occurrence of one event is influenced by another event kind of disjoint event where it is more of you know whether a particular event if the particular event is not influencing other event that's what you call disjoint event and you can clearly identify from this particular Venn diagrams and you have other terms being used in probability particularly like probability density function which is called pdf and normal distribution function and central limit theorem so probability distribution the uh, probability density function is particularly which is what we generally call it as a pdf that's a shortcut we use where we actually come up with an equation that describes the continuous probability density function and these are certain things uh, let me get it over the right thing so how it applies to data science i just want to check it so this is normal distribution so what actually happens is whenever you're being given a data set you try to see whether your data actually gets into a normal distribution data form or not so based on that you predict what is its mean what is its standard deviation and all that okay that's where you use this normal distribution concepts and later you will apply certain probability density functions all that so this is how generally being used this data points which you are seeing in statistics is actually the real data set you apply here and that data set when you put using certain graphs like uh, here it is a line chart something when you get a bell, bell curve when you get a bell curve that means your mean is standard deviation is in the middle so that's how you determine the data and central limit theorem this is actually like a you know a kind of a hypothesis kind of thing where we say that sample distribution of mean of any independent random variable will be normal or nearly normal so it is talking about the normal distribution part and you can see based on the n value when it is 1 3 10 or 50 how this bell curve comes up so there are other terms we use like marginal probability joint probability conditional probability so marginal probability is more about uni probability i would say where you actually determine the occurrence of a single event whereas when you say joint probability it is like the probability of two events happening at the same time like for example when you say the probability that a card is an ace of hearts is p if you consider that there are 13 hard cards in a deck of 52 and out of them one in the ace of hearts so it is like how what is the probability of two events happening at the same time that's what you determine like for example if you say the probability of person talking and at the same time listening that's a joint probability and when you say conditional probability it is like again influential probability i would say where the outcome of one event will dictate the occurrence of another event kind of so it is like let's say you have an event and if that event is uh, you know happened that event actually influences another event to happen kind of and you have certain probabilities in order to determine that and base theorem uh, this is more like formula guys like you know it is like this is the base theorem formula where it says where it actually 
shows you the relation between one conditional probability and its inverse the formula looks something like this it is like probability of a by b it's a conditional probability is equal to probability of b by a into probability of a i think this is little uh, indented wrongly so this is how you apply Bayes theorem these are some of the applications which you can look at like for example when you run a clinic and when you test if a patient has liver problems or not say let's being that's being the you know problem statement which you have to pick it up and in that first one how you determine using Bayes theorem is first you determine 10 percent of patients from there before they have problems like free air probability that around 10 percent of your patients from before they have problems let's say that is p of a and the probability that patient drinks because drinking influences the liver issues let's say if it is 15 percentage which is your probability of b and the probability that they drink even though they have a liver problem may be around five percentage which is probability of a by b and the probability that they do have liver problem is calculated something like this which is 0.05 into 0.10 which is your 10 percentage divided by 0.15 this 0.05 is your five percentage the probability of a by b into probability of a divided by probability of b so that says that 3.33 percentage has the chance of getting liver problems now where is this applications being used all your machine learning algorithms most of your machine learning algorithms when you say you might have seen the machine learning algorithms when you run it it always shows you something called accuracy and loss percentage so accuracy is more about how much confident uh, you know how accurate the data uh, how accurate the algorithm is able to predict your say for example if you have gained it given a covid data set how accurately it is able to predict whether a particular patient has covid or not that accuracy percentage is what your accuracy indicates and again in that there will be a loss that means there are certain cases where it will not be able to predict wrongly there will be that loss percentage that is what these are all determined using your probability again and that actually helps you to optimize because when we look at this accuracy and loss we try to tune it and optimize it so that that actually gets us to a state where we can get close to the accuracy percentage which is what needed now coming to statistics so statistics and data science is very close in terms of you know the way they are if you look at what exactly is statistics is you know it is basically a branch of science which deals with collecting data analyzing interpreting and getting some conclusions around it and your data science is exactly that data science is all about statistics plus some kind of tools which you use here in this case it could be python or your machine learning tools which you have that's what your data science is so i would say data science is not a new field it's a field which is there from long time back just that it is there as a you know mathematical measure using which we used to do that manually like conducting surveys whatever like for example if you remember long time when people want to uh, identify let's say in a particular country to identify what is the average family number in a particular country whether it is four or six i'm talking about the average they used to go to each house collect some numbers saying how many number of children are there how many family members are living all that right that is all people used to go you know go home to home and used to collect the data mostly they used to appoint certain people mostly teachers is what i have seen in my place that's how it used to happen with data science what happens is since every data around it it's available online or through some means it's all available in a way where you can just query it or call an api and get the data to do it that's why i said statistics plus technology is your data science okay and there are certain technologies you get around statistics something is like population and sample population is the entire data like here if you can see the entire fish tank which is like the entire population sample is just the representative data of your entire population when i say representative data if i ask you how many people in us are nigerians or black people then by using whatever measure you cannot determine that accurately there will be some uh, barrier here and there right so what exactly people do in order to determine it they take a sample so when you say sample sample should be the representative of the entire population when i say it's not like sample you should choose any other data there are different mechanisms also to collect the sample because what people do is because applying any algorithm on a population is a huge time taking process and it's very cost cost effective also uh, costly also so that's why people take the sample that means the representative of the population based on some particular sampling measures which we will talk about it in a while then they apply all their algorithms technique on the sample then they will reflect back on the population or they will say according to applying something on sample this is what it gives us and population it will be like a corresponding to it we will say population will be like this that's how people do it 
now like i said there are different sampling methods these are the ones so how you collect sample is very important so there are different types of samples one is property sampling another is non property sampling in property sampling you have random sampling systematic and stratified sampling and non property you have snowball quota and judgment sampling and convenience sampling so let's look at each one of them so in random sampling as the name says you randomly choose people or you randomly choose the data points in order to do something on it that's what called random sampling it's like there is no rule you randomly pick people from uh, or pick data from here and there and start your work on that in systematic sampling what happens is you either say i will select every second person or every fifth person or every 10th person now how you determine that every second every 15th every 10th or every 12th or it again depends it again depends on the problem it again depends on certain measures but in systematic sampling it is about choosing from every entry card now this is stratified sampling stratified sampling the other name is called strata stratum stratum is nothing but you know a subset of population which actually shares one common characteristics like for example in this case if you look at there's a male and female subset the male subset is one stratum and this female subset is another stratum so there are two stratums here and from there you collect again you apply like here there is a male subset stratum and female subset stratum in this you will again apply random sampling from there you will get this that is how we do it now statistics also there are different types of statistics and this is very useful guys if you guys are willing to start your career in data science so in statistics there are two types of statistics again one is descriptive statistics another is inferential statistics descriptive statistics talks more about how you describe data in the form of tables or certain mathematical measures or graphs that's called descriptive that's why they named descriptive you describe the data in one form or another in order to show what you are trying to say whereas the other part which i said inferential statistics inferential like the name says you try to predict based on existing data about the new unseen data so inferential statistics is where your probability is heavily used so these are the two types of statistics available and inferential statistics is heavily used in machine learning whereas descriptive statistics is where we use in lot of times in data science because in data science whenever you want to represent a mean median mode or the line chart bar chart those are all comes under descriptive statistics so here is some of the descriptive statistics given one is measures of central tendency which is where your mean median mode comes in the name central tendency comes in because you're trying to represent the entire data using a midpoint value and in order to identify that midpoint you can either use mean median or mode and there is another kind of uh, descriptive measure which is called measures of variability which is what tells you how spread your data is from the actual mean so that is where your standard deviation or variance comes in so this is what i was talking about measures of central tendency mean median mode and this is the measures of variability where i said variance and standard deviation there are other things also like range iqr interquartile range so range is more about you know you determine two quartiles and from there you actually determine q1 and q3 okay anyway we will talk about it let's complete this part first what is measures of central tendency so measures of central tendency like i said like for example just take a simple example if i if let's say if i'm a class teacher and in the class teacher if somebody came and asked me what is your average class mark i will not say alan got 10 rakesh got 50 or linda got 70 i'll not talk about each and every mark right i will talk about average mark which is like one mark representing the entire class mark that is called your average or in statistics term it is arithmetic mean so that's where the central of one type of central tendency comes in where you are trying to represent one data value out of all of the data values you have where you just take the average and tell it and the mean is basically highly influential highly influenced by the outliers so this is how you take the mean where you calculate out of all the values and divided by the number of values there are other measures of central tendency also median so median is where what you do is when you have given certain data points you actually divide them into two halves where before doing that you actually sort the data you can sort it in ascending or descending order doesn't matter once you sort it you try to take the middle value and in the middle value is what it gives you median and this is not something influenced by outliers so just to give you information outliers are some data values which are not following the actual data range a simple example could be let's say in a class we have 10 students each of the student is getting 70 or 75 marks and there is one student who is getting 5 marks that 5 marks guy is an outlier because he is not following the trend of the class because every member in the class is getting 70 to 75 and is the only one getting 5 or that is one outlier i'm talking about the lower outlier 
there could be higher outlier also where everybody in the class is getting 60 to 70 and there is one guy who is getting 100 that 100 guy is the outlier so these kind of outliers actually influence your mean heavily that's why we go for median in some cases and if you still want to go with mean what we generally do is we actually cut off that outlier values and calculate the mean that's how we actually proceed while we are doing the data pre-processing part in the data science now coming to mode so mode is like the most repeated value i'll tell you the general application if you have ever browsed on amazon they will tell you one thing the frequently bought items or frequently purchased i mean frequently commented items or frequently you know viewed items how that frequently thing is coming is because of mode in that what they actually do is they look at all their products and they will see who where the lot of customers are going based on that they will find it mode is exactly that the most repeated value is called your mode and some in mode also there are different things there is a uni mode buy mode and try mode also and that's again when we go deep you'll learn about it measures of spread is all about let's say you came up with a mean but do you know when you say measures of central tendency you are trying to represent one single value which actually should be getting a sense of the entire data isn't it but do you know the other data points you just know the average of all the values so but you have to know some way the approximate number right that's where the spread comes in where what spread will tell you is how much distance each data point is the from the mean that is what the spread tells you and for that we have different mechanism one is range where we take the maximum and minimum value another is interquartile range another is variance and standard deviation so iqr is something around this q3 minus q1 if i remember this correctly ha huh, q3 minus q1 this is how they calculate they actually divide the data into three quartiles so in order to do that what they will do is first they will take the entire data set first get the median once you get the median you have two halves of the data the first half of the data if you are getting the median that is your q1 second half of the data which is on the right hand side if you are getting the middle value that is called your q3 and the middle median which you identified first is your q2 now iqr is your q3 minus q1 that means the first right half of the data median and the right first left half of the data median and the right half median value and variance has a formula again if you look at the formula closely what it is trying to identify is that xi is each data point from each data point how much it is distance to calculate distance we are taking the subtraction that x bar is mean that's what we are doing and divided by n so this will give you the variance or distance between the mean for all the data points and the square root of this is your standard deviation the same thing the square root of this is the standard deviation okay so at least on the whatever we learned so far those are the ones basically related to data science mostly i would say the other parts mostly i would say the gain part i hope this session is useful to you at least you learn something new okay guys that's all for today see you all in the next session